Good morning, church. All right. So I'm not Mitch. I'm Mike. I'm pinch hitting this morning for Mitch. Um, let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you uh, just for the opportunity to gather together as your children, to sing your praises, uh, to agree with one another in song about your goodness and all that you've done for us. Lord, as we open your word, I pray that you would guide us, that you would use it to transform us and conform us into the image of your son, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to start off reading some statements here, and you're going to be like, these are real downers, Mike. Thanks a lot for that this morning. Um, but I'm going to read these, and then I'm going to ask a question. I've been out of work for months and can't seem to find a job. Uh, I've lost a family member to disease. My spouse is showing signs of dementia, and I don't know how I'm going to care for them. My child is struggling with addiction and depression. Our family's living in an atmosphere of conflict and tension at home that doesn't seem to end. And this last one we're all familiar with. My community was hit hard by a Cat 4 hurricane, and there is so much need that I feel paralyzed. I could go on, uh, but I think you get the picture. And if I were to tell you that those, what I just read to you, are just a small sampling of the kinds of struggles that are going on right here in this community, in this community of believers, would that surprise you? And I hope that it wouldn't. I heard some, no, it wouldn't, right? And it shouldn't surprise you because if you thought that Christians were somehow immune to suffering, if, if you thought that trusting Jesus and following Jesus was somehow a ticket to the easy life, <laughs> then you haven't been around the church very long. And if you're thinking, this sounds really depressing, well, it, it gets worse. So hang in there. <laughs> hang in there. When I hear these things, I ask a question that I'm sure all of you have asked at some point in your lives, and that is, why? Why, God? Right? The, the Sort of the classic question, how do I reconcile my good and loving God with my pain and with the pain of others around me? How do I live as a follower of Jesus in light of the reality of suffering? Because clearly we are called to just that, to live for Christ within that, within that reality. All of us here fall into one of three categories this morning. Either we have suffered a trial, we are currently suffering through a trial, or we will suffer through a trial sometime in the future. Now, if you are here this morning or you're with us online and you would not necessarily consider yourself a follower of Jesus yet, you're kind of checking things out, you're probably thinking to yourselves, this guy's the worst salesman ever for this thing. <laughs> you may be right about that. Because who wants to sign up for suffering? Like, who would, who would do that? But the reality is, as, is, as uncomfortable as this truth is, the fact is that Jesus promises trials to his followers. In John 16, which we should be familiar with, in this world you will have trouble. Not might have trouble, could have trouble, will have trouble. But I would say don't bail out on me yet. Because the, the, the fact is that everybody has dark times, Christian and non-Christian alike. And if there's any Christian that's ever tried to lead you to believe that the Christian life is rainbows and unicorns, well, then they are misleading you. I would call that fake news or misinformation, disinformation, one of those things. We all suffer. But I can tell you that God has a purpose in the pain of his children. And if I'm going to suffer, I want it to mean something. I want it to have some purpose. So I would invite you just to, to listen along, and hopefully we'll understand a little bit better what God says to the church about our suffering. How do I live as a follower of Jesus in the face of the reality of suffering and trials? This is a, it's a deep question, and I'm not, I don't pretend that we're going to get through all of it, even though I went long the first service. We're not going to get through all of it in one message. There's just no way to do that. But hopefully we will get a good foundation here. The Bible tells us that 
in general terms, we suffer trials or what I'll call black water experiences, and I'll explain that term in a little bit here, for one of three reasons. One of those is our, our sin, right? Our rebellion against God and his ways and our own poor decisions. So an example of that would be, well, you know, um, my spouse is leaving me because I was unfaithful to them, right? Uh, or I'm in bankruptcy because I took out a bunch of unwise loans that I couldn't pay back, right? These are things, trials, black water that come upon us because of our own foolishness, our own sinfulness in rejecting the ways of God. But those aren't the only reasons. We also find ourselves in trials because of situations and circumstances outside of our control, like a hurricane, Right? Or, uh, you know, a, an earthquake or even the poor decisions and the sinfulness of other people. So, I, you know, the person who loses their job because their boss made foolish decisions or sinful decisions about the company. And then the third reason, and this is one people often forget, is that we sometimes will suffer through a trial as a result of our decision to obey God because of our righteousness, and that's, you know, an example of that would be, well, I, I, I lost my job or I was passed over for a promotion because I refused to mislead my customers the way that my boss wanted me to. So we can suffer through a trial for any one of those reasons, but the reality is, the fact is that no matter what is the cause of that black water experience, I think we can find answers and guidance in the life and the Psalms of David. And that's where we're going to go today for a little bit. David was a shepherd. He was the anointed one of God. He was a war hero. This is David of David and Goliath, the David who slew the Philistines. He became the prototypical Israelite king. Um, he was Israel's poet king, and he penned many of the Psalms that we love and that we read here in the church. But this was a man who suffered tremendously. He suffered all kinds of trials. He was hunted. Not only was he hunted, but he was hunted by his own father-in-law. Now, I don't know about you guys. Some of you may have a bad relationship with your father-in-law. I don't know. But I'll bet you he didn't throw a spear at you. David was hunted by his own family. He was betrayed by those who were closest to him. He lost children. He made some epically destructive, sinful decisions in his life. He was driven out of his own kingdom. And that's just to name a few of the trials that he went through. So he knows and he knew suffering. And when we look at the life and the sufferings and the writings of David, I think one thing becomes abundantly clear. And that is that in the dark times of life, we're not alone. That God is ever present with us to guide us, to strengthen us, to sustain us while he transforms us into the image of his son. See, God teaches us things in the darkness that we would never have learned in the light. And I love the contrasts of the Psalms because in the Psalms you get the heights of joy and the depths of despair. And I want to look at a couple of Psalms this morning just to give us a little taste of that. Psalm 22. I'm just going to read the first two verses of Psalm 22. This is a Psalm of David. And that's repeated by Jesus on the cross, so it's very familiar to us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. And you could hear the anguish in his voice. And yet, the very next psalm, Psalm 23, which we're also very familiar with, takes on a completely different tone. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, this is the same man who in one moment is despairing of his very life, and in the next moment is able to praise God for his steadfast love, his guidance, and his care. 
And what I think we see through the life of David is this paradox that is a big part of the Christian life. And that is this, that there is this existence of hope and joy in the presence of suffering. Now, when I first started in ministry, I was a children's pastor. And so whenever I would teach to the children, I would always have what I called a big idea. And I would, at the end of the, at the, end of the message, I would make them ask me, what's the big idea? I'm not going to do that to you. Um, and then I would tell them the big idea. So I'm going to do you guys a favor. I'm going to tell you the big idea up front instead of waiting till the end. And the big idea today is this, that God is present and purposeful in our pain. He's present and purposeful in our pain. That's what I believe that God led David to discover throughout his life, led him to write down and to pass along to us. If we look at Psalm 139, for example, verses 7 through 12, it's sort of rhetorical. There's a number of rhetorical questions that are asked here. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. God is present, and he's purposeful, even in our pain. Now, I think in parables and metaphors and stories, that's just how I remember things. You know, Jesus taught that way. Sometimes Jesus taught that way to confuse the people. Other times he taught that way to help his disciples to remember certain things. So this is one of those latter times. Um, And this is not a parable you're going to find in the scripture because it's one I made up myself. And I call this the parable of the hard hat diver. Now, when I was much, 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 much younger, I worked as an, an underwater construction as a commercial diver. And I think we have a picture. There it is. That's me up there. Uh, 20-something-year-old me. And before you start thinking about, you know, Jacques Cousteau or buried treasure, you know, sunken treasure or whatever, get those ideas out of your head. This is a dirty job. Um, I did things like ship's husbandry, which sounds really nice, right? Except that what it means is cleaning off the bottom of boats and unfouling the screw of a boat that got, you know, ropes wrapped up in it or whatever. Uh, We also did things like salvage, right? Just underwater garbage collection, Okay, so this is not a, a, a uh, glamorous job at all. And in order uh, for us to go through this parable, I'm going to take you back to my first, uh, or rather my last diving job before I got out of that horrible profession. Um, and before I tell that story, I just want to make a couple of clarifications. When we talk about, and I'm going to explain the term black water here, black water is a diving term that means zero vis- visibility. It's not just low visibility. It means zero, zero, no light can penetrate it, it's visibility. So just so you understand that. When we talk about darkness, now in the Bible, sometimes darkness means deeds of darkness, okay, evil. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, if you've read, as uh, Ed referenced this morning, John eight twelve, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in the darkness, right? Jesus was talking about spiritual darkness, and so that is true. But what we learn from Scripture also is that many men and women of Scripture, great people of the faith, learned things, tremendous things, in dark times in their lives. So the black water that we're talking about here are trials, the trials of life. So my last job as a hard hat diver was in the beautiful, exotic Anacostia River, just outside of Washington, D.C., if you're not familiar with it. It's uh, one of the more polluted rivers around. It's really nice. It was March, so think cold, very cold, frozen, below zero, or below freezing at least. Um, And as I showed up for this job uh, at the Benning Road Power Plant, which is along the Anacostia River, and uh, the first place I had to go to was the briefing room. So the briefing room was, uh, they had taken a... uh, 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 employee break room and kind of transformed it into a briefing room. So we had the schematics for the job that we were going to be doing. And the job that I was going to be doing that for the next several weeks, months there at the Benning Road Power Plant was to clean out the inside of an intake tunnel. So about, yeah, so about 1,500 feet, between 1,500 and 1,800 feet of intake tunnel, which is basically a big 
you know, on the river side, it's a great big room, huge, it's enormous. And then as you follow it back, it gets more and more narrow and, and lower. So until it finally gets to the back end, it makes a hard uh, left-hand 90-degree turn. And when you finally get to the pump, you've got about this much clearance from the ceiling, and you can touch the sides with your fingers. Okay? There is no direct access to the, to the surface. This is what we call a penetration dive, which means you got overhead. The only way out is back out the way that you came. So if something goes wrong, you're in trouble. So the briefing room, we sit down, they give me a lovely cup of sludge, which they called coffee. And so it's cold, I've got my sludge, I'm there with my tender and the dive supervisor. We go over the schematics, he explains the job to me, and I understand all, what the tools that I'm going to be using that day. And from there, I suit up into my dry suit and we head out to, uh, to where we're going to get into the water, where I'm going to get the water. And I sit down on a, a little chair and my tender, now my tender is the guy that helps me get into my gear. He's also the guy that has the communications radio so he can talk to me. And he's the one that has the schematics on the surface. So when I can't see down there, my darkness is as light to him because he has got, he's got the map and he knows where I am and where I need to go. Now, the last thing in my getting suited up and I've got all my tools on me and everything else is the last thing that go on is my helmet. So I get my helmet on, we test the comms, we break the ice. There's someone there to break the ice because the river's frozen, so now you gotta break the ice and get down to get down the ladder. And so we begin to descend the ladder and the water pressure as it comes up your legs starts to squeeze the air out of your dry suit and so it gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until the tightness is up here around your neck. And I'm gonna ask you for this last part just to close your eyes for a second. Go ahead and close your eyes. The last thing to go below the surface is your face plate. And then blackness sets in, and this. Now as you get to the bottom of the ladder, you put your foot on the ground. It's complete darkness. You can't see your hand in front of your face. You can open your eyes now. I don't want you to fall asleep. And you turn away from the ladder for a moment, which you think you turned about 45 degrees. And then you realize, well, I don't want to lose my, my bearings. I should get my hand back on that ladder. And you, and you reach out. Where's the ladder? And you feel around. And you turn back the way you thought you went. And you feel around. And you don't feel anything. And all of a sudden, this sort of overwhelming sense of panic starts to rise up in your chest. And your heart starts to beat. And you're... <sighs> You know, and you don't want to mess this up. Now, you don't know where you are. How are you supposed to get to the job site and find the big suction thing to suck the mud out of the tunnel if you can't, but, right? And all these thoughts start to go through your head, and you freeze until you remember, and you, because you hear a voice. There's a voice in your head that asks, diver on bottom? And you go, that's right. I can talk. I've got a tender. I can communicate. Diver on bottom. Roger that. And then you kind of sheepishly, sheepishly tell your tender, uh, I kind of got turned around. I let go of the ladder. And he says, okay, it's okay. I'm going to pull up on your, on your umbilical, and I'll explain what that is in a second. I'm going to pull up on your umbilical till it's taut. And then, okay, you feel that tension? Yep, okay. So you want to take a big step to your left towards the tension and stick your hand out. You should feel a wall. Sure enough, whoa, there's a wall. Hallelujah. <sighs> okay, my heart's starting to slow down a little bit. Okay, now... I want you to follow that, turn to your right, follow that wall, keep your hand on the wall, follow it back. You're going to go about 10 paces. At about 10 paces, you should run into another wall. 10 paces out, boom, there it is. Oh, man, it's like he knows what's going on. It's like he's got a map. I've got the wall. And on it goes until you get to the job site. By the time you get there and you've got, you know, you've got the big suction thing there and you say, make it hot, and they start making it, and you've got your fire hose to break up the mud and all that kind of good stuff. And you're, you're feeling more confident. Your, your heart rate's down. You're feeling good. And you're cold and miserable still. I mean, really miserable because it's March. And it's really cold in there, even with a dry suit on. And that suit is tight and it's squeezing you in places you don't want to be squeezed. And it's not fun. And you're thinking the whole time, I can't wait to get out of here. But you know that you have a seven-hour shift. Yeah. 
Now, what on earth does this have to do with the trials of life? I'm glad you asked. Let me explain. It's not just a fun story. Um, Let me explain the parable. You know, all of us, as we said in the beginning, all of us are going to have trials. And so we need to understand in the sort of in the briefing room, in preparing ourselves with the Lord, we need to have our expectations set correctly. First of all, we need to expect the trials. We need to expect pain. If you look at Job 1.1, 1, 1, uh, it says this, In the land of Uz there, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And yet, if you know the rest of the story of Job, you know that he lost everything. And he suffered tremendously, more so than most of us will ever suffer in our lifetimes. And you go, hold on a second, but he was blameless, he was upright, he feared God and shunned evil. And even Job's friends who came to, his friends who came to counsel him were saying, well, clearly you must have done something to deserve this because this doesn't happen to righteous people. And I think sometimes we think that too. We believe in what the, what the Old Testament saints would have called the retribution principle, meaning that the righteous prosper and the wicked suffer. Now, that's a principle, and it is in Scripture, that generally speaking, if we walk with the Lord, if we are righteous, meaning we make right decisions in accordance with the Scriptures, that more often than not, life will be, we will be more successful in life than not. But it's just a principle, It's not a hard and fast rule. And clearly in the life of Job, there was suffering and there was pain. So we should expect it. Jesus promised it. Therefore, we should expect that it is going to come. The second thing is we need to remember in our briefing room before the dark, before the black water experience, we need to remember the fact that God is with us in our pain. Psalm 145, 18, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. I had to be reminded of that when I was on the bottom and I was starting to panic. I needed my tender to say, hello, did you get to the bottom yet? I mean, it's been a little bit, right? The Lord is with us in our pain. And then the third thing is that he has a purpose in that pain. Not only is he with us, not only should we expect it, but there is a purpose. James 1, 2 through 4 says, consider it pure joy. Pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Before you enter a black water moment, a black water trial, you need to remind yourself that God is present and purposeful in your pain. We need to expect it. We need to know that he's with us in it and that he has a purpose through it. The second thing is we need to know our tools and we need to trust our tender. We need to know our tools and we need to trust our tender. You don't go into a a penetration dive. This is not a rookie experience. This is not something that you go into without any any training. When you descend that ladder and you encounter your first black water, you need to know your tools so well that you can operate them with your eyes closed. When I was in dive school, what they did to us is they took tape black tape, and they put black tape over our faceplate, and then they would chuck a bunch of pieces into the bottom of a tank and then say, okay, go put it together. And they would give us our tools, and we'd have to go down there and put it together. Well, if you didn't know your tools well enough that you could, and that that item that you were supposed to assemble, if you didn't know it well enough that you could do it with your eyes closed, you were in trouble. You were in trouble. How does this translate into our spiritual life? You know, we have the Word of God. We've been blessed beyond blessings, to have the complete word of God in our hands, freely accessible to us. We need to hide God's word in our heart now. We need to know the promises and the character of God now so that we can preach those things to ourselves in the darkness. We need to let God's word equip us because, number one, it will oftentimes keep us out of those black water experiences that are brought on by our own sin. David said, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, right? So hiding God's word in our heart can protect us from our own foolish, sinful decisions, but it can also help us to persevere through this, those, those black water moments that are brought on by circumstances outside of our control or brought on by our own decisions, our righteous decisions to follow Christ. So we need to know our tools. We need to learn and understand.
in the light. Ooh. I need to know this microphone. All right, I'll hold it down here. The tender was there. Thank you. Which leads me to my next point. We need to know our tender, right? How, how familiar are you with the Lord Jesus? Have you been walking with him in obedience and in prayer in the easy time, in the daylight times? You know, you don't, you don't just grab somebody off the street to be your tender. That's dangerous, right? People that do that die. In fact, I actually had a guy that I worked with who died for that very reason. So you don't just grab a tender off the street. It needs to be somebody who knows what they're doing, that you trust. How well do you know Jesus? Have you walked with him in the good times, in the light, so that you are able to trust him when the lights go out? Now, not only does God give us the tools, but he also gives us his presence. He also gives us a life support mechanism that is completely not on us. It's completely him, which is fantastic. It doesn't depend on me. Divers, a hard hat diver, has something attached to their helmet called an umbilical, which is a great name for it, because it gives life. And there's three parts, at least three parts, in an umbilical. Those are your air supply, very not the band. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Your air supply, which is very important, obviously, <laughs> for obvious reasons. You don't want to run out of that. The second one is your communication line, which is just as important. That's how you can, it's going to allow you to communicate freely and openly with your tender. And then the third piece is what they call the strength member, which is usually just a, a rope. And what that's for is if all else goes wrong, if everything fails and goes sideways, they can pull you out of that tunnel by that rope. So you have that umbilical. Well, the Lord gives us an umbilical of sorts as well. We have his Holy Spirit, which interestingly, the, the Holy Spirit, the word for that, for spirit, pneumo, means air. The helper. This is the one Jesus promised to send us, that Scripture tells us will guide us into all truth, to comfort us, to convict us when necessary, to fill us with his power when we need it. You know, what David said in Psalm 139, that rhetorical question, where can I flee from your presence, is a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious, nowhere. He is ever present with us in his spirit. But that umbilical that the Lord gives us also includes our communication line. Scripture in Hebrews 4.16 tells us that we can boldly approach the throne of grace because of what Jesus did on our behalf. We can go directly to God the Father in prayer to receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So we need to remember to call out to him. Our, our darkness is as light to him. He has the schematic. He knows the beginning from the end. And finally, that umbilical that the Lord gives us includes our strength member, our rock, our redeemer, Jesus, and his body, the church. See, our strength is in Christ, and our hope is in the promises of God that Christ guarantees for us. What are those promises? As you're in that dark water moment, what are the promises of God that you're reminding yourself of? He will never leave you or forsake you. He will never allow you to be tried beyond what you can bear. Nothing can separate you from his love. You can do all things through him, and on it goes. Do you know those promises? Do you understand that those promises have been guaranteed to you by Jesus Christ, and that he comforts you and supports and strengthens you through his body, the church? Are you connected to this community? Am I connected to this community? Am I connected to people who can and should be coming alongside to strengthen me, to strengthen you in our time of need? You have to remember that when you descend into darkness and you lose all your bearings, panic will rise up inside you. will begin to creep in. Shortness of breath and disorientation and inability to think clearly. Feelings of abandonment. Has anybody experienced that recently? Yeah. I think most of us have at some point. And left alone, those kinds of feelings will paralyze you. They'll paralyze you. You need to remember what you learned in your briefing. 
You need to know and trust your tender. You need to remember who God is and call out to him, and he will answer you. You know, if you need to be forgiven because this dark water, this black water experience is something that you brought on yourself, well, then ask for it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to believe that. We need to have that hidden away in our hearts. We need to pray, as, as Mitch talked about last week, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. We need to come before God in our anxiety, in our anxious moments, and we need to pray and trust the promise that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We need to trust in him with all our, with all our heart, lean not on our own understanding. Now, I thought that I had turned 45 degrees to the right, but, but my tender knew better, and he knew exactly how to get me back to where I needed to be. And I needed to trust him and not my own understanding. And if you do those things, pretty soon you will be saying along with David, you are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord turns my darkness into light. You will experientially, experientially rather understand the big idea, which is God is present and purposeful in our pain. Now, eventually you may come out. And I say may because there are some people that will stay in, in different stages of a Blackwater experience through their entire lives. And those people need extra grace and prayer and support from God's people. But you may, by God's grace, come out into the light again, this side of heaven. Only now that light seems to be brighter, it seems to be warmer, the fellowship that we have with other believers suddenly uh, is, is so much sweeter, we have peace and rest that we felt like we've never experienced before. It's like this feeling of relief when you're finally in the warm air again after having been cold, very cold. <laughs> and I got to tell you, as I came up out of that river after seven hours of being very, very cold, so cold that sometimes, you know, I can wake myself up at night remembering how cold it was. And having that light hit my face and having that tender reach down and pull me back up out of the water, grab a hold of my harness and, and help me up that last couple steps of that ladder. And if, if I might have been crazy, but he actually was better looking than when I went in. And, and it seemed like the warm, like that it had been cold when I went in, but now it suddenly felt lovely outside. And I'm thinking, wow, the temperature must have gone up. And then they pop that hat off of your head and they hand you that cup of coffee. And I'm like, wow, you guys got different coffee. This coffee's fantastic. I love this coffee. Getting some warm clothes back on. That's the part of the dive that we all look forward to. When we're in a black water moment, that's what we look forward to, and that's what we encourage ourselves in. And, and I think David was the same way. If you look at 2 Samuel 22, 5 through 7, and then verse 17, and this is a psalm that David has kind of tucked away in a narrative, um, and here's what it says. The waves of death swirled about me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called out to my God from his temple. He heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. And then verse 17, I love this part. He reached down from on high. He took hold of me, and he drew me out of deep waters. He is present and purposeful in our pain. And I would love if you just read all of 2 Samuel 22, and I encourage you to do that. You, could, you can hear the joy in David's words there, the excitement, the praise. He's thrilled because he knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has been present and purposeful in his, in his pain. And that's not an easy perspective to hear when you're in the dark water. When you're having a black water experience, you don't necessarily want to hear that. But I can tell you this, when you look back on it and you see how your confidence and your trust in God grew through that, and you can recount how the Lord provided for you through that, and how he kept his promises, how he rescued you, how he comforted you, how he worked all things together for your good. You can see how your courage increased throughout that, how your patience and wisdom grew. And all of those things you can now see in the light that you couldn't see when you were in the midst of that black water experience because you were just surviving. But I tell you, as wonderful as it is, 
as wonderful as it is to emerge from a trial in life, and it is. And I pray that if you're in a trial, that you would emerge and you would come back into the, the sunlight. Even that is really just a picture, an image, a shadow of something greater. Because after all, in my parable, it was still March, and it was still below freezing. And that tender was just as goofy looking as he was when I went in. And in fact, he was only happy to see me because that meant his shift was over too and he got to go home. Same sludge for coffee. But you know what? When we finally emerge, when we spiritually ascend that ladder and enter into the light of the presence of God in the heavenly places, we will truly see. We will be the final product. We will feel real divine warmth. We will understand once and for all what God was doing in and through us in our Blackwater moments, what God's purpose and plan was for us in our trials. You know, as followers of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we have hope in the trials of life because we know that we are in God's hands. We know that we've been forgiven of our sins, past, present, and future. We know that Jesus paid the penalty. He accepted the wages of our sin on himself on the cross and defeated death by rising from the grave three days later. We know that that battle is won and that God is now transforming those of us that trust in him, in his son, that he is transforming us into the image of Jesus. And so now we can say with the Apostle Paul, that our light and momentary troubles, I love that he can call his troubles light and momentary. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You can face the trials of life with that kind of hope and confidence only through faith in Jesus Christ. I want to ask the the worship team to come back up. Um, David, if you read in David's Psalms, you'll see that he often followed a formula And that formula was that he would start off with despair and then a crying out to God for deliverance and then God's deliverance and then doxology. And doxology just means exuberant praise. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to have some exuberant praise. Before we do that, I would just encourage you, church, and encourage myself, really, because we all need this to get our expectations straight. In this world, we will have tribulation. We will have trials. Prepare yourself. Get right with God through faith in Jesus if you haven't done that. That's the first step. Practice his presence in the word, in prayer, and in obedience, walking with Jesus where he walks. And then get and stay connected to the body of Christ, this community. Because whether we're suffering right now or we're between trials, We are all in this boat together, friends. And when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And most importantly, never forget that God is present and purposeful in our pain. Amen.